Hi, this is Tom, Weird Video Games, and I'm here interviewing Mark Knight, the composer for Populous the Beginning and uh, a lot of other stuff I'll probably go into. Thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. How are you doing? We finally got this together. Yeah. So uh, I have to say, like, doing research for this interview is probably the most fun I've had doing research because I've been discovering all kinds of interesting things. <laughs> uh, for instance, like, a... Uh, a year or two ago, I was just streaming some Amiga games uh, for my uh, uh, Twitch. And uh, you know how sometimes people will like stick like an intro on uh, old Commodore or Amiga games? And it had like this really awesome cover of Wizardry. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, who did this? And I went like looking for it. I found it. And uh, so I downloaded it. That's cool. And then uh, now when I'm doing research, I realize that was you. <laughs> it, it, Wizardry was, was one of my favorite. It, it was just such a cute little tune on the, on, on the, on the Commodore 64. And funnily enough, um, mm -hmm. there was a lot of discussion about it quite recently, as in yeah. this guy, Mike Allsop, who wrote the music to Wizardry, doesn't exist. There is no guy called Mike Allsop. <laughs> Really? And I, I, can't, I can't now remember the name of the guy who wrote the music, but Mike Alsop was an alias of somebody who, um, yeah, because everyone, I think, I think people were trying to find who the guy was, and uh, he, he doesn't exist. Um, but they, they did eventually track down the, 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 uh, the actual composer. It was just one of those things, I think, you know, um, back in those days, I mean, th th this would have been around about 1992, I suppose, 91, 92. So I would have been at college um, finding any excuse not to go to college. And I think one day I thought, hey, let's let, let, let's just do a quick Amiga conversion of the track in sort of my style, as it were. <laughs> ask you about Populous the beginning since that's what I did the video for. So what was your uh, inspiration there? How did you approach doing this game? Uh, well, yeah, Pop was, was the first first game that I, I did for, uh, for Bullfrog. Um, and uh, at that time, Bullfrog was my dream developer to go and, go and work at. Um, mm -hmm. And it was quite a strange scenario of how, how we, there was a number of us that all joined at roughly the same time time because uh i was i was working at a company called mindscape and uh, mm -hmm. we were working on the follow-up to warhammer shadow of the horned rat a game called dark omen and uh towards the end of development um i was well sacked basically made redundant because i'd written the music mm -hmm. and then a few months later the whole development team was was basically closed down and electronic mm -hmm. arts bought the development team and dark omen off of Mindscape, so they all moved over to EA, uh, Stroke Bullfrog, and then uh, my 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 boss, a guy called Richard Leinfelder, um, who who was a Commodore 64 programmer. He he wrote games like Barbarian and Sacred uh, Sacred um, Oh God, what's it? Sacred Thing of Antiriad. Uh, but it, basically, he worked for a company called Palace Software, and he got me back in at Bullfrog, um, and uh, yes, yeah, so so. Populous, I pretty much went onto Populous straight away. Um, and as with most games I worked on back in those days, the style of music was something completely and utterly new to me. Hmm. So it was a case of sitting down with a load of a bunch of th synthesizers and, you know, finding sounds that you liked. And then just, uh, we wanted something that was ambient sounding, obviously needed to be ethnic. Um, the previous mm -hmm. Bullfrog composer had come up with some kind of vocal sound effects that he was using throughout the soundtrack, which then I incorporated into what I was doing. So I'd say, as with pretty much everything that I was writing back in those days, um, it was an experiment because I'd never done the style before. Right. Populous was an experiment. Dungeon Keeper 2 was an experiment, etc., etc. Um, 
I, obviously, I, I think I probably listened to a bit of Enigma and stuff like that back in those days, which which was quite an ethnic sounding um, band. Uh, and literally, for, for me, normally, it's I'll find one sound that gives me inspiration. And I remember with hmm. Populous, it was the instrument that I used in the first track, which was that do 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 do. I just loved that sound, and that just me sort of like mucking around on a keyboard <laughs> grew into what Populous ended up being. I guess um, I find it quite difficult to, to to give you reasons why I write stuff the way the way it is for me. Right. A lot of the time, it just comes out like that. <laughs> I, I can relate to that actually like <laughs> my own composition I have a hard time articulating how or why I make decisions it's just like I just do what seems to work <laughs> yeah I, I mean half the time my, 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 my answer would be oh I was drunk I can't <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was quite quite weird because, I mean I, I'm, I'm a very melodic based person coming back coming from the yes the demo scene and the chip tunes where um, you know with chip tune the sounds are often so horribly shit um that if you don't have a good melody to kind of build it all up then you end up with something that's just quite horrible um mm -hmm. and i went with ever since i started listening to music with commercial commercial music which wasn't really until i was probably about 12 years old or so i i immediately started listening to jean-michel jarre and mike oldfield and tangerine dream so i was always drawn to instrumental music uh, and often instrumental music which had some kind of strong melody um so uh, in some ways uh populace was was so far removed from anything that i'd ever done before because for a start it, it didn't have drums they uh, you know right. we added them for the for, for the fighting but the overall idea of what the music was supposed to be it's supposed to be background it's supposed to be ambient it's supposed to not get in the way it's supposed to be the sort of stuff that you could kind of listen to and drift off to, and no matter how many times it repeats, it doesn't get annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as as and it was luck, as luck would have it, I, I pulled it off, and uh, Populous has ended up being one of those soundtracks that that people remember me by, and I still get you know emails and and and, and stuff now, just just saying hey loved your music to populous back in 1998 or whatever it was you know and it's rather lovely really that's great um so you also did the uh, amiga port for wing commander that was my first job yeah yeah so um i i'm guessing unlike the dos version they actually had a cd so that kind of changed how they wanted to do music uh what's the uh, how did this come about um yeah so so I mean, the, the DOS version that I had, um, I mean, I, okay, I, 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 I think it was on floppy, floppy disk for me. Um, right. And uh, was using the AdLib sound card on the PC, which was which used a horrible Yamaha FM-based sound chip. Um, mm -hmm. So, so the, the quality, although for PC owners, it was better than what they were used to because they were used to right. a, a little bleeper speaker. Um, oh, right, that thing. <laughs> and, and it was just at that time I'd, I'd finished um, college and uh, I wanted to go into, uh, I wanted to do a music technology degree um, in the UK. And there were only two universities in the, in the country that offered it. And uh, one of them needed um, the college, college certificates, which we call A-levels over here. Um, they wanted an A grade in music, maths and physics to do a music course. And it's like, well, I can probably do the music one, but the maths and physics, I'm never going to get grade A's for. Um, so I had one option left and um, I play the violin. I played the violin since I was six years old and I went to do the auditions and I, I took a violin with some effects pedals that I borrowed from a music shop and blah, 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 blah. And they turned around and said, oh, no, a classically trained musician can't deal with music technology. And it's like, I, well, hang on, what the fuck? I, I, you know, <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a cassette of my of my MIDI music that I did with an Atari computer and a Roland synth. Um, so I sent off loads of floppy disks to as many games companies as I could find in the UK um, and heard nothing for quite a while. And so it's like, well, what am I going to do now? I'm not going to university. Uh, I'm going to have to get a job. 
and literally and, and I, I know this sounds really really cheesy but it's <laughs> actually true the day that I was filling out my application form to do management training at the local supermarket um, Mindscape gave me a call and said uh, would you like to do the Amiga conversion for Wing Commander so um, yeah so I ended up with um, some MIDI files which were take which which the PC used to play back the, the soundtrack right. on the Adlib um, and uh, actually I tell a lie there was an Adlib version but there was also a sound card on the PC called an LAPC1 which was made by a synthesizer company called Roland um, and that mm. had a lot better sound than, than the than the uh, FM version so they sent me the MIDI files for that sound card and then it was a case of me just listening to it all over and over again and trying to work out how to convent condense these 24 instruments orchestral sounds down to the four channels of the amiga um Ooh. also with a with a memory budget of 200k for all the samples oh. um and uh, yeah you know we did it I, I i listened to it back now and i think actually i could have made it a lot lot better but back then i was 19 years old and um a lot of a lot of the the tracking things the, 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 the tips and tricks I was still kind of picking up as I went along um, but mm. um, through that about a month or so before I was supposed to finish on the project um, Mindscape offered me a full time job at the company so and immediately oh. of course I, I snapped it up and uh, and that was that um, and it was, it was a very very fun project to do because most of it I was doing at home in between other things um, I met some good contacts out of it. The guy who, who programmed the game, a guy called Nick Pelling, uh, I went on to work with again doing Duke Nukem on the PlayStation. Um, so it, it was that it was that it was that big break, as it were. It was the break that got me into games, and I've been there. You know, 27 years later, I'm still doing it. Mm, that's <laughs> that's awesome. Luck. Luck. Yeah, <laughs> our timing was superb when you think <laughs> about it. I mean, it wouldn't happen nowadays. Um, just the way the games industry has yeah. matured and grown and and now you know everybody and their pet dog can write some form of music at home because the <laughs> technology is available to them um, whereas you know back in those days there was a much much bigger technical aspect that you had to master with limited channels right. limited memory and that sort of thing so for me they were really good good times I, I really enjoyed trying to squeeze what we could out of these machines that half the time it was supposed to be impossible what you were doing on them you know so um another game you did the music for was the old nes battleship game which huh. i've actually played before and uh a few uh, I, <laughs> what's that i've never played it <laughs> oh <laughs> um i think the one that stood out to me the most was the uh, just the in-game battle music uh, I don't know what it is, but there's something about it that kind of reminds me of uh, Naoki Kodaka's work in, uh, like, Blaster Master. never been a, a nintendo fan so right I, i've really uh, I've, I've never really played any nintendo games um that was a really really quick job that came in whilst i was at mindscape and and they gave me um this uh, well very, very similar to the super nintendo they gave me a silver box and said use that there's no documentation <laughs> work it out um no. And it was a case. I mean, the battleship music is is is, is awful. It's <laughs> terrible. Um, but it was. It, I, I had a few days to do it, and it was literally make a three-channel MIDI file. I think it was on the Atari. Import it into the PC, oh, and then geez. this this horrible sound came out of the silver box, and, and that was it. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to forget about Battleship, but too many people, <laughs> too many people keep reminding me about it. <laughs> Next well, I, I Mario, that would be even worse. I, I was actually going to ask about Mario. You did Mario's Time Machine. Yeah, fucking um, uh, not, not, uh, 
<laughs> not a game that's well remembered, but it's got interesting music. <laughs> it's uh, it, interesting is a is a very um, <laughs> is a very <laughs> polite word to use. I had night. Mario gave me nightmares. It actually gave me nightmares. I ended up having these dreams where I was oh, no. in a completely dark room, mm -hmm. being chased by this massive, great big Super Nintendo with three legs, and the power button and the reset button were its eyes, and then it had these massive, great big triangular teeth at the front, um, because the the, the, the um, oh, the the SNES for me was was really really frustrating to work with. Yet again, I was given a silver box and said, "Use this." There's no documentation, and um, when I look back on it now, it all makes sense. Um, but back then, I had no idea of the concept of compressing samples. Mm -hmm. Everything on the Amiga was raw uh, files, AIFF or raw files. Mm -hmm. um, so you could load a sample in, you could loop a sample by putting the start marker at one point and the end point marker at one other point, and the sample would loop. On the Super Nintendo, because it uses compressed, it compresses the samples into memory, it's only got 64 kilobytes for the memory, but then mm -hmm. I think it's three or four to one compression, which then gives you, you know, 200K or whatever, 256K of memory. So I, I was putting these samples in and trying to make them loop and I could never get the sounds to loop properly, which is why you, mm. you listen to almost anything I've done, which isn't a lot on the SNES, none of the samples loop properly, because mm. I had no idea how to make them loop properly and nobody told me how to loop them properly um, and it was, it, was a, it was a massive, massive cause of frustration for me because, you know, like most people, whatever work you do, you want it to be the best and yeah. there's me, you know, I'm hearing the sort of stuff that Tim Follin was doing on the SNES with oh, games yeah. like Clock or whatever. And it's like, well, why, 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 why can't I do this? Why can't I get this sound to loop? Um, so, yeah, Mario was was awful. I actually worked on two <laughs> Mario titles. Um, oh, but yeah. the other one, yeah, the other one didn't get released. There was Mario's Time Machine and Mario's Mission Earth. And one <laughs> of them. I've never heard of, the, of that. No, well, what, yeah, they were both edutainment titles. Right, of course. But, um, Mindscape's parent company was uh, Software Toolworks, and they were they were hev they were trying to heavily get into this edutainment, and I guess <laughs> they managed to get some kind of license from Nintendo to cr to use their IP to create games that were supposed to teach you something. Um, all it taught me was that I didn't want to work on Super Nintendo. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they, 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 the, the Super Nintendo days weren't, weren't fun days. We, we, we did a game called Out to Lunch internally at Mindscape, which again was on Super Nintendo and Amiga. And uh, you, can, you, can, you can tell that if, if the same tune was used on both platforms, you could tell quite easily that I knew what I was doing on the Amiga and I hadn't got a bloody clue what I was doing on the Super Nintendo. <laughs> Uh, you were one of eight people credited for Standard Music on Theme Park World, also called Sim <laughs> Theme Park in US. Uh, so, um, what, how much was your involvement in there? Because, like, you guys won a BAFTA for that. That's right. Well, fr from a musical point of view, absolutely zero. Um, oh. and, 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 and it was a real problem for me because I was the in house composer at, at Bullfrog. Um, hmm. But my manager didn't like me. Oh. <laughs> and so. so we 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 done we done populous we done dungeon keeper which dungeon keeper two um, and then theme park came up and he said I'm going to get other composers to pitch for the work and I was like but I'm the composer at Bullfrog yeah but you know I want to see what other people can do and uh, so I said well if you're going to do that I'm not even going to pitch I'm not interested you know Ooh. if you're not going to use the composer in house or you're going to you're going to give me competition to see whether I'm good enough or not then I'm not going to do it. Um, so I ended up doing, well, I ended up helping out with the sound design. But, um, Richard Joseph, who's sadly passed away now, um, mm. and Rebecca Parnell were the main sound designers behind it. And then there were other people at, at EA Bullfrog, like Adele Cutting, who did quite a lot of sound design for the game. Um, and we ended up with a really, really amazing sounding game. Those guys did a brilliant job. James Hannigan did the music. Um, but there was loads of it. And then there was like, uh, we're also going to release it on PlayStation 1. And the PlayStation 1 has 512K of memory um, compressed. So around about one and a half meg. And 
we had a stupid amount of for, for, when you when you're talking about sort of like the late 90s theme park had a serious amount of sound in it um so my 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 main role on theme park was to get everybody else's sounds and cut them up so much that they could fit onto the playstation but still mm. sound okay um but yeah that was that was quite a difficult job because there really was so much sound in that game um but it was good for me to do that work because I wasn't proud of any of the sound design work because I hadn't done it. So I didn't care what I cut or what I faded out or what I deleted. Mm, Whereas all the people, they, you've just cut my work in half. You've deleted my work. Well, yeah, that's not my problem. I've got a job to do and, and, and that's it. So, so my main role really was just squeezing the sound into the platforms um, rather than a lot of sound design. I mean, back back in those days, I would never have never call myself a proper sound designer. I was a composer who happened to have to do sound design because that's what the job was when you were one person working in a company of, of 12, 15, 16 people. Um, and the, uh, it, it was, I write music, oh, shit, I've got to do the sound design as well, you know. Um, I mean, that's changed a lot now. I mean, I... I most of the work that I do nowadays is sound design and not music. Um, and I love it now. Whereas back then I, I, I didn't, I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, but as I will probably talk about throughout this, you know, I found a niche working on car games and I enjoy cars and that. So I found this area of sound design, which I absolutely adore, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I stand by the BAFTA. I stand by the fact that I was part of the, of the team who won the BAFTA um and yeah it's 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 it was a it was a lovely game it was a brilliant game love that game sorry <laughs> cool um so you worked with david whitaker on alfred chicken is that correct well i, I didn't work with him <laughs> right and but but yeah so 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 david wrote the uh wrote the game boy i mean alfred chicken was just a game but was just a game boy title um hmm. And Dave wrote the music for it, and then they decided to do Amiga and CD32 conversions of it. So naturally, interesting. It, it was a case of me, me then just create. Yeah, a few people have said, "Are you sure?" Because <laughs> there seems to be some contention on the internet as to what Dave did do on Alfred Chicken and what he didn't do and what I did and what I didn't do. Dave did the Game Boy versions. I did the Commodore versions, which were basically just just remixes or, or, or conversions of, of his Game Boy work. Uh, I had the music on a cassette. That was it. We we had one conversation, and I don't know whether Dave was going through a bad time at the time, but he, he wasn't exactly the most helpful of chaps, um, mm. which which I told him off about in years later when, oh, when both of us were working at Electronic Arts. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was just one of those jobs that comes in, just bang it out quickly, and then on to the next one, you know. Although I did, I did do a new credits tune for it, which was based out of mainly chickens clucking. <laughs> uh, so I had chickens singing the melody of the of the credits tune. So that was my own little addition to 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 the to the title, I suppose. <laughs> That's that's so interesting because I always thought of Alfred Chicken as an Amiga game. I didn't realize it was Game Boy first. Ah, uh, yeah, no, it was it was Game Boy first, uh, uh, and <laughs> indeed, um, the character Alfred Chicken. <laughs> we had a it, we had what we call a by election um, in the UK, where I, th I think a by election occurs when a uh, a, a member of parliament has to leave their job for a certain reason, so then they have a, a like a re-election. And mm. and we put Alfred Chicken in for the re-election to be the <laughs> member of parliament for somewhere down down in the, in the southwest of England, I think it was. <laughs> he lost, but he I think he got about nineteen votes or something. <laughs> Not bad for a chicken. <laughs> so um, you've been involved in Project Hubbard. Um, so yes. how did you get involved with that? Um, well, I've I've known Chris Abbott, the guy who's who set it up um, mm. for around about 20 years now um and that came simply because i am a massive commodore 64 music fan it's what got me into the my love of electronic music mm -hmm. before i'd heard jean-michel jarre 
and Oldfield and Tangerine Dream and that, I was listening to Rob Hubbard, Martin Galway, Ben Daglish, etc., etc. Um, and uh, so back in the late 90s, Chris started these back in time things, which for me was like, right. oh my God, it's, it's, it's updated Commodore 64 music, must buy. Um, and then eventually Chris got me to, to, to do some violin recordings for, for one of the, one of the back in time CDs. I think it was back in time three. <laughs> then we formed a band called Sid eighties, um, which had Ben Deglish and, uh, John Hare and uh, a couple of, uh, you know, 64, um, kind of legends and whatever in it. Um, and, um, so I, I, I've kind of done these back in time gigs with Chris over the years for the last 15 years or so. And uh, then Project Hubbard came up and um, I don't know whether it was actually his initial plan to have me involved doing a CD or anything, but I had parted company with Codemasters and suddenly I needed to find a way of earning some money. So Chris offered me um, a, a little bit of a lifeline and said, well, look, would you be interested in doing a CD for, for Project Hubbard as one of the additional bonuses? And it's like, yes, okay. Because I've been a massive Hubbard fan for all those years, and, and I mm. do attribute um, a lot of you know me getting into games down to down to, get down to him and and the other big big three big four on the on the sixty four back in those days. Um, and I also and still am going through a phase of really, really, really enjoying the sound of 70s synthesizers and the music by people like John Carpenter, uh, that, mm. that sort of style, that kind of almost dark, eerie synth style. So I said to Chris, okay, well, you know, I'll do it. This is what I want to do. I want to do it in a sort of like a John Carpenter style. Um, very, very analog sounding. And uh, so he's like, yeah, okay, that's cool. So, you know, I, I, he want, I want about 10 tracks and for it to last X amount of time, I'm thinking, nah, the, the math between the money and the number of tracks uh, and that just did, wasn't going to work for me. So I thought, well, actually, let's look at this. Jo you know, John Carpenter is not a happy composer. You know, he doesn't write many kind of, jiggly jiggly tunes and most of rob hubbard stuff is happy and jiggly jiggly and it's like well they're not going to work uh, and which tunes would work being kind of stripped back drums taken away made more made darker and and so i ended up with four tracks um uh, three of them probably being over over 10 minutes long knuckle knuckle dusters kentilla and delta um and so i thought okay let's do this let's do those tracks let's let and, and put myself in the mind of rob um because i think in some ways um what he's done in the past comes out in what i've done because i've listened to so much of what he's done so it's like what would rob have done here had he got more channels to to work with what would he have done here um and so that's how the tracks grew and grew as it happens rob absolutely hated at least one of the tracks, which very, very nearly didn't get included on the CD. Um, mm -hmm. He hated it with a passion. Um, and oh, it no. took a, a lot of convincing, I believe, from Chris to say, well, look, actually, everybody else who's heard it loves it. So, uh, and I think it's really big. It, it was the Knuckle Dusters track. And I think it's because Knuckle Dusters is very, very obviously a heavy metal soundtrack. It, mm. it, it's it's heavy metal, but it's a Commodore 64, so it's it's not distorted yeah. guitars and drums and that. But I think in Rob's mind, that's what Knuckle Dusters is. I, th I think that's quite obvious. <laughs> And somebody's come along, made it, made all the drums half the tempo they should have been, made it darker, and taken it in such a different direction to what you're used to imagining in yeah. your head.
that it, uh, it just didn't agree with him. Um, but I'm pleased we did it because I, I, I think it works, you know. Um, the weird thing is because it was a part of a Kickstarter and I don't know, I don't know how many people have got it. Um, and again, because it's a Kickstarter, I've got no feedback from anybody as to whether they like it or not. So I've got no idea. I think it's great, <laughs> but then I would <laughs> think that. Um, but I spent a huge amount of time. I ended up spending probably four or five times the amount of time that I should have done doing the, what's it called? Escape to new Rob. Um, yeah. Simply because um, I felt that I owed it to Rob to do the best job that I possibly could as a way of kind of saying, thank you. It's a shame mm. he didn't bloody like it, but that's, that's not my problem. Um, I, I wanted to, for, for that, for that gig, I, I wanted to go to town and just really, really, really get it right, as it were, and just in terms of the sequencing and a lot of the stuff. I'm not, I'm not a keyboard player or a piano player. I, I can play in one key badly, um, but I was determined that not everything, because some of it's quite difficult. But I was determined to actually just play a lot of the stuff into Cubase which is the sequencer that I use, rather than sitting there with a mouse drawing it in. I wanted that kind of human feeling of getting things slightly out of time, maybe hitting the wrong notes. Because back in the 70s, if you hit a wrong note on the multi-track, um, if, 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 um, if you're on limited tracks and you're um, merging tape tracks together to give you more channels, once you've recorded something, that's it. You can't change it. And uh, so I kind of took that mindset. If I made a little mistake, as long as it wasn't horrific, um, then I'd keep that mistake there because that's what would have happened back in the 70s. Hmm. Um, so that's kind of like the, the mindset that, that I took with, with, with doing the whole thing. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I took way too long doing it, but I, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be as good as I possibly could have made it. Um, I guess the mix still could be better because I'm not a brilliant mix person. It's always been the bane of my, my music is I could write a piece of music and then when I mix it, I make it sound awful. Um, but uh, I did, I, I completely and utterly did the best that I could on that, you know, just had to. So, uh, like, do you and Rob Hubbard know each other or is it just entirely you heard uh, from someone else what Rob said or? Well, uh, Rob and I have, have done a couple of gigs together. Um, oh, yeah. Him on, him on piano, me on violin. Oh wow! Um, at these back in time things, um, uh, but but I, I I met Rob previous to the back in time stuff because again, being part of Bullfrog and then Electronic Arts, at a time when Rob was still at Electronic Arts in the States as well, and uh, every year EA would have a, a worldwide audio council meeting where a representative from the audio departments from every team of electronic arts around the world would get together somewhere in the US or maybe Canada. Um, so I, I met Rob uh, in Vancouver. I think it was Vancouver and, and Dave Whitaker as well. That's right. Cause Dave got really, 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 really drunk. Um, and uh, if I remember rightly, we stole his credit card and, and then paid for the <laughs> on, on his credit card. <laughs> um, but so, so, so I knew, and, and that was at a time when, uh, back at back at that time, Rob was like a, a, a kind of like a, a musical god to me. So I, I was a right brown nose, you know, opening <laughs> doors and almost to the point of calling him sir, but not quite. Um, but uh, you know, yeah, because because I grew up through all of my early teens and stuff being influenced by the sort of stuff that he was doing. So. But we, yeah, we've, 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 we've done a couple of gigs on stage together um, and had a few laughs. I, I, I got him drunk one night and, uh, <laughs> yeah, he came back to the, to, the, uh, to the hotel and there was myself, um, Rob Hubbard, Ben Daglish, I think Ben was there, John Hare, and uh, I got the vodka out and uh, we had quite a hefty session so much so that we were driving back to the venue the next morning and Rob had to stop the car and he threw up at the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and from what I understand now, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't touched vodka ever since. And, and, and that was in 2004, I think it was. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, 
so let me just ask you, uh, well, uh, let me ask about like what projects you're involved in right now. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, so it's been quite busy, <laughs> hence why it's been, what, April, May, June, July, you know, three and a half months of trying to get this interview sorted out. Um, Honestly, but, every time I collaborate with anyone, it's like this, so <laughs> yeah, it, there's, I mean, you know, no worries. It's not normally that bad, but it, it just mm -hmm. it just happened. So, 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 I mean, I've, I've been self-employed now for, for nearly um, two years, and uh, so one of the projects that I'm working on is, is, uh, is a game called Beam NG, um, which is, a, a, funnily enough, it's a driving-based game, um, <clears throat> but it's got this really, really amazing physics system uh, and the way the cars deform is absolutely fantastic. It, basically, all the cars are built from rods, which which each individual rod can bend and break and and whatever. So I, I'm helping out with sound design on that. Um, I've also been doing some music and sound design for an online casino, um, a cryptocurrency casino, which a company formed by Jez San, who used to own Argonaut Software back in the in the Super Nintendo days and that. So uh, Star Fox was their big game, I think, if you remember that. Um, so I, I'm still doing a bit of work from them. Um, when you got in touch with me, um, I was getting towards crunch time um, on a game called NASCAR Heat. Um, so NASCAR Heat is a franchise that's been going for quite a long time. Um, and... You know, I, I don't think any of the guys would be too upset with me saying that the sound in that game has been shocking. Um, hmm. So I, I was pulled in um, earlier this year by a guy that I used to work with at Codemasters. And he used to be in charge of Formula One, and he's now working for a, a massive uh, motorsport media company called Motorsport Network, and he's in charge of all the esports and that sort of thing. And so he asked me if I would go help these guys in America out on NASCAR Heat 4. So, um, yeah, so we, we've got car on track, recorded that, and basically stripped out the audio and put new audio in over... I was working on it part-time from January, so it wasn't a, a massive amount of time to get this work done, um, but it was really, really enjoyable. So that's been... That, that, I finished that about three weeks ago, I think it was. The game's now in submission and, and I think they, 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 they just come into the end of doing the first day patch and then the game comes out in September. I've got my album, which is, I mean, I'm 46 now and this is my first proper synth album that is not game related or chip tune or anything. It's wow. just me and synthesizers. That's coming out on Saturday. Um, oh, wow. And I, th I think that's it at the moment. Um, yeah, so I, I'm waiting for the, for, for the next opportunity to come along. Um, oh, I'm also doing... Uh, I'm also doing the sound for a powerboat simulator for the Dutch Navy. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, uh, and then I, I also um, do a little bit of work for uh, a couple of Formula One teams uh, doing the sound for the simulators. Um, so right. I, I'm doing a little bit of help for one of the teams at the moment who are further down the grid at the moment, but they are if you ask most people in the UK what their for, their favourite Formula 1 team it will be this team because they've been going for so long they're independent so just by saying that if you do a little bit of research you'll, you'll work out which, which team it is um, so I'm, I'm doing a little bit of work on the side for them um, just to help them improve the simulator so the drivers get a better experience of being in the zone when they're in the sim um, and, and I love that sort of stuff. I, I've, I've always, always loved that. And, and, and Formula One, I've, I've been a, an avid supporter of since the early 90s. And, 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 and now to get opportunities of building recording systems into nose cones or whatever of Formula One cars is, for, for somebody like me, is just massive. Because um, it's just not a job. It's not a job. It's just fun. You know, it's, it's long hours. You know, you could be spending... 16 17 18 hours a day on on track um, or at the track but uh it's a lot of fun so it, it's a mixture of a bit of this it, basically when you're self-employed it, it ends up being whatever work you can get you know so uh, i'm i'm just lucky at the moment that most of it is is kind of still motorsport related as it were you know so um of all of the work that you've done what would you say is like some of your favorites hmm 
Okay. Um, so, I, I, from a from a, from a musical point of view, um, Dungeon Keeper Two still st stands out as being one of my proudest moments. I think. Um, again, I was working in a style that I wasn't familiar with or comfortable mm. with. Um, so, it, for me, it was experiment. It was experimentation. Um, the Dungeon Keeper One soundtrack was very, very ambient, almost sound effect driven. So the the, the soundtrack in the game was was very much um, sound effect driven. Um, so we I started off like that, but what we wanted to do was have an interactive soundtrack that built as you progress through a game, ultimately mm. to the fighting scene when Reaper would probably appear. Um, at, at which point I started, I, uh, we had gothic drum and bass playing, <laughs> which, you know, I've never written anything like that before in my life. But it, again, it, it was it was fun to do. It, um, it was interesting. Um, it was different. I just I didn't just want to copy what Russell Shaw had done for Dungeon Keeper 1. I wanted to kind of yeah. not progress it because that would be putting what he did on Dungeon Keeper 1 down. But I wanted to put my own stamp on it. I didn't just want to copy somebody right. else's work and do the same. Um, <clears throat> so I personally have always been proud of that, just for the, just knowing how out of my comfort zone I was for most of that soundtrack, and ending up with a result which, um, again, seemed to go down very well with a lot of people. <clears throat> um, Project Hubbard, I'm proud of. Um, yeah. From a sound design point of view, um, I think I think probably Dirt Two for Codemasters, um, simply because I started at Codemasters in two thousand and eight. Uh, my son had just well, my, in fact, I started in two thousand and seven, um, but my son was born only about six weeks after starting at Codemasters, mm. and the game. Race Driver Grid was already in alpha period, um, so we worked on that, and we did. I did what I could with with the other guys to make the game sound as as, as good as we possibly could. And then once Grid had finished, um, I basically wanted to change everything that Codemasters did in terms of audio for their games, and I did change everything. I threw away all the car recordings. Um, managed to eventually and it was bloody hard work but managed to eventually convince the management to invest some time writing a new engine playback system for the for the engine and the exhaust sounds of the cars uh oh, the list goes on basically just threw everything away and started the game um and if you listen to a, if you listen to, if if you can, I mean, I mean, I suppose videos are the easiest. But if you listen to Race Driver Grid, and then you listen to Dirt Two, the difference in quality, as in Dirt Two improvement, is it's a massive improvement, and I, I'm very very proud of that. I mean, it was not me, just me. Um, it was a, it was a team effort with there. There was myself, um, Mike DeBell. No, I, uh, the other thing was. Uh, it was a very small team, uh, really small. And so I went and headhunted all the people that I wanted to work with who I knew would do a good <laughs> job on these sorts of games. So Dave Sullivan came in, who, who was previously working down in Brighton on racing games. Mark, Mike DeBell had previously been working at Bizarre Creations. Um, Chris Jojo was a freelancer who just did all sorts of great things on, on various games. And so I kind of put together a, a dream team Mm -hmm. um, of people got, changed the technology, got rid of the recording and so it was all new, all new and, and, and yeah, the results for me are spectacular um, if, you, if you AB one game and then the next game that come out, the jump a little bit like NASCAR Heat I mean if you put the two, if you put NASCAR Heat 3 against NASCAR Heat 4 when that comes out again you're going to notice a massive jump in the quality of, of the sound. Uh, I don't mean to sound like I'm boasting, um, but um, that's what I've got back from people who have seen the promo videos and stuff that have come out so far. Um, 
so it looks like with with the NASCAR people, it's going to go down really well, if you know what I mean. So yeah, I'd, I'd say I'd say Dirt Two for sound effects, Dungeon Keeper Two for music. <laughs> do, do <laughs> no, you that's, that's great. Do you disagree? I've got. I've really got to play Dungeon Keeper Two now. <laughs> I can send you the music. Otherwise, basically, Dungeon Keeper Two had three twenty-five minute in-game tracks. Oh, okay. Um, um, and each in-game track had five levels of around about five minutes in. So it started off really, mm. really ambient, and then just kind of grew. So mm. percussion started to come in, pipe organs, choirs, until you got to this bizarre drum and bass thing with choirs and analog synths as well so hmm. it's 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 i'd say it's different um hmm. as in it's a bit weird maybe um but i i loved it <laughs> it was great um i i, I say I, I can send you the mp3s if, if you'd rather hear because the, the way that i did the mp3s because I, I wrote the music in a more linear fashion so i i i, I, right. I approached it as a 25 minute piece of music and then hmm. once I'd done that, then I I then wrote tiny little sequences of how you would be able to jump from one level to the other and for it to be hmm. seamless and not noticeable. Um, but the actual music itself was written in a linear fashion, just with natural progression and growth through it. And then I worked on the interactive side of it after I'd, after I'd done that. That may be the completely wrong way to write interactive music, but it's the first time I've ever done it, so that's 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 the way I've decided to do it. Mm, that sounds <laughs> amazing. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm super jealous of you, like, hanging out with Rob Hubbard and stuff. Like, yeah. uh, he's a, I'm a big fan of his, too. He has no online presence at all, so... No, he um, hasn't. I, 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 I know most of the 64 composers to a certain degree i became right. very very good friends with ben deglish um oh, yeah. very very good friends uh and and indeed um <sighs> i've i because I, I i i played the violin at his funeral um oh. and and at his memorial gig so so i, I yeah i when they when they carried his coffin in to the um to the crematorium there were four of us walking behind the coffin and I was playing the violin I I didn't know what the music was so I had a copy of the music and I had to sell a tape it to the back of the guy I was following um but um yeah Ben Ben hit me uh really really hard um yeah because I mean, I mean Rob for me Rob was always back back when I was kind of over enamored by these 64 composers it was always mm -hmm. rob's music that that stuck with me the most um but ben because we we played in a couple of band bands together he tended to compare a lot of the back in time concerts for me he was the ultimate musician he was the ultimate performer he had really really good stage presence he had an amazing way of being able to communicate to the audience and he can play mm -hmm. every flipping musical instrument under the sun as well. Mm -hmm. he, he can, you give him an instrument and he would have been able to have got something musical out of it, even if he'd never tried to before. Um, so, um, but Rob, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't kind of forget the, the fact that, you know, when I, I think the first Rob Hubbard soundtrack I heard on the 64 was Commando. And <laughs> Even now, Commando is still one of my favorite all-time 64. Yeah, same here. Commando kind of uh, awakened my like um, appreciation for video game music. Yeah. Uh, like before Commando, I, like I barely even noticed video game music. It was just like something that I had playing, like yeah. something that just plays while you're playing the game. Um, then after I got like game overs, uh, like a whole bunch of game overs in a row one day, I just like stopped playing and just kind of sat there and the title screen music just kept going, kept going. And, like it's it. And I'm like, this is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I like little, like, I don't know how old I was, like six or something. Uh, okay. Six year old me is like, it's like, Whoa, listen to this. <laughs> it, it blew my mind. It really did. Yeah. Um, I, I hadn't really got a, a, much of a concept of <clears throat> computer generated music before the Commodore 64 and <clears throat> I got I got Commando quite early on I think the only games that I had before Commando were Super Huey 
which had quite nice music, and Forbidden Forest had quite nice music. Oh, yeah, Forbidden Forest. And then Forest. Commando came along and just blew the shit out of everything I'd heard. <laughs> All the little ring modulation noises and the percussion and the great yeah. melodies and the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm with you. It, it seemed to just keep on going on and on and on and not stop you know there were all these yeah. different elements to it yeah um so i mean i could critique it i'd say that it goes on a little too long but uh <laughs> there are a bit of, when, when you get that yeah i'll shut the fuck up carry on you know yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like he made it one night so like <laughs> exactly exactly yeah you, you know uh, and i completely appreciate that because i yeah. I, I, I couldn't do that in one night and not mm. only that it's not like he was sitting down in front of a keyboard with Cubase or you know a professional music sequencing software. He sat there with his head, probably mm -hmm. a piano or something, and assembly code. That's it. It's yeah. Like, bloody hell! <laughs> how did you? Do, how do these guys do that? How how can they have it all in their head and then reimagining it with? assembly code I, I, I it blows my mind you know and that that that's that for me is why nowadays I, I i get a bit pissed off with computer music computer game music because like, oh everybody's got to sound like hollywood we've got to have orchestras and you've got all these composers <laughs> doing video game music and they're all writing the same shit which it sounds brilliant but you won't remember it when you go 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 and have a shit you know when, you, when you're sitting down on the toilet you're not going to remember those themes and those melodies because they're, they're, they're simply not there. But back in those days, they had melody. They, they captivated you and brought you in. And, you know, I, I, a lot of that has just been lost in, in games now. It's the same with films, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. If I said to you, sing me the theme tune to Iron Man, you won't be able to because there isn't a theme tune to Iron Man. It's just, right. it's just an orchestral soundtrack. <laughs> it's... It, it's you know funny I because when I when I uh, interviewed Alexander Brandy, he was saying a lot of the same stuff you're saying. I, th I think well, Alex and I are, are, are around about mm. the same age, and mm -hmm. uh, and we started in the industry at, around about the same right. time. I mean, a Alex has had a much more prolific career than I have, um, mm. but we're I, I I think you know the, the, when I've spoken to Alex and that, I, I get the feeling that we're very yeah. much on the same sort of wavelength. Mm -hmm. um, but I think probably a lot of composers and that who were doing stuff in the 90s feel the same. And, and also, you know, I find it a little bit frustrating that, you know, OK, the mix quality won't be as good. But something like, like what I did with Dungeon Keeper or what, what, with, with, what with Alex did would very, very easily stand up today. But it's all forgotten about. Mm -hmm. We're forgotten about. We never get mentioned. You know, all, all of these guys who were doing all this, in some ways, more amazing stuff because the technology was a lot more limited back in the 90s, nobody gives a damn about. Um, that's the way it is. You know, it's a mini Hollywood nowadays. And, you know, yeah. like I say, films are the same. You, you get, you know, a director will cut a film to, a pre, to an existing soundtrack. So, like, they might do, right, let's, let, we'll make a film. It's a new Avengers film. Um, now, how are we going to cut the soundtrack? Okay, well, we'll use the music to Iron Man to cut the soundtrack. And then they cut the soundtrack, and then they get so used to the music to Iron Man that they then go to the composer and say, well, we've, we've cut the film to this soundtrack, so you need to write a soundtrack that is similar to this pre-existing soundtrack. That's why so many films all sound the same now, because they've already yeah. been cut to existing music, and the directors can't then get that music out of their heads. So the new music has to be mm. similar otherwise they feel it doesn't work so i mean indie scene for video games is great because there's more chip tune there's more electronic music um there, there there are far less boundaries in the indie scene and that's what i like with a lot of this stuff if i tell you what if you want to hear a good soundtrack my one of my favorite game soundtracks at the moment is a game called subnautica the original subnautica one. have a I'll listen look to it up that. It's it's a mixture of ambient electronic music and then there's some techno in it, and the guy who writes it, a, a guy called Simon Chilin, Ch Chilinski, I think the soundtrack is absolutely phenomenal, and it's what I often listen to now when I'm in bed trying to get to sleep because I can kind mm -hmm. of zone out to it. And I love it. I think it's brilliant, and I, I I think more people need to know about that soundtrack. It's absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. So you go and have a listen to that. <laughs> I will. <laughs> 
uh, my my video game music collection is constantly expanding, and yeah. uh, uh, I have mentioned in like my video before. I don't just like keep complete soundtracks. I'm like, well, I like this one from this one, this one from that one, and then I just slowly like build it up until I've got like over um, 26 hours of video game music <laughs> now, and I just play it when I'm driving. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 great. I mean, I I used to do the same thing. I mean, because now I work from home, I'm hardly ever driving, but. Uh... Back in the days when I used to mod my car stereo with bass bins and all that sort of stuff, I was always churning out this game stuff. And, you know, you'd, you'd stop at a traffic light, and let's say, for example, something like Commando came on full blast out the yeah. car, and everyone turns around and it's like, what the fuck are you listening to? <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like this, you know, they, they all think I'm mental, you know. But that's it, you know. I, I, it, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful genre of music. Um, mm. or, or, or like I say, at least used to be, but I'm just pleased now that the indie scene is seeing oh, yeah. the sorts of styles of music that we used to see back in the early days, kind of making a resurgence, right. as it were. We don't I'm... all need to make Hollywood sounding orchestral soundtracks for right. whatever game we're doing. It's like Formula One. Um, you know, I did three years worth of Formula One soundtracks before, before that I was in charge of the sound design. And then I became a manager and, and I'm a shit manager. I will always be a shit manager. I'm a sound designer and I'm a composer. You don't make sound designers and composers managers because they won't do a very good job at it. And that's what they did with me. And I said, well, why don't I do the music for Formula One? Because it will save a bit of money. I'll do it at home with my equipment. I'll do something electronic because then you haven't got to record live musicians. And that's why the Formula One soundtrack switched from being orchestral to being electronic simply because it was cheaper um and it didn't matter you know some people liked it some people absolutely hated it but to be honest with most of the music i've written take take duke nukem you know you either hate it or you love it it was written for a target audience which was europeans not americans that's why there's no rock music in it because the europeans were more into electronica and techno and dance music and that and it's like well if we want to make more sales in Europe, then the music should be more appealing to those people. But of course, the Americans and, and probably the Canadians as well, who are used to ba -dam, bam, ba -dam, bam, on big guitars and that, it's like, what the fuck have they done to Duke Newcomb? It's awful. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's always like that, whatever you do. But hey, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> so, um,. That's uh, all the questions I've prepared, so uh, I'll just say thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, making time for this. You're welcome. All right, have a great night. You too. Take care.